I was quite astonished to know what it was because it had no propeller. And John replied, oh, it's easy, old boy. It just sucks itself along like a hoover. There was the awful race against time. There was the skullduggery. She used to say, oh, well, Daddy's doing something very hush-hush. I thought, oh, my goodness, why didn't I think of this before? And it seemed so obvious then. A small English church is the last resting place of a man who didn't just change the face of the earth, he enabled us to see what it actually looked like. His name was Frank Whittle. This is the story of how he invented the jet engine. He overcame all the odds, only to see the British government almost throw his idea away and miss a chance to shorten the Second World War. I was born on June the 1st, 1907, in Coventry. My parents were working class. My father was a foreman in the machine tool manufacturers. I lived there in Coventry for nine years, went to an elementary school there, and then the family moved to Leamington Spa because my father bought a small, very small, engineering outfit called the Leamington Valve and Piston Ring Company. And I really did get my first engineering experiences there because I helped him sometimes for I think it was about tuppence an hour or something like that, uh, uh, making slots in valve stems. In Leamington, Frank also won a scholarship to the town's secondary school. I was very lazy with homework and got a, a series of raspberries for that. But at the end of term, I often do quite well, for instance, I'd come top of maths, something like that. I never did win a prize at school. But I did an awful lot of uh, private study. I used to go down to the library in Leamington Spa and study all sorts of things which are not in the school curriculum. And, uh, and that was where I first started to learn about gas turbines. I uh, was always attracted to flying from my earliest years almost. When I was four, my favourite toy, and this was 1911, uh, was a tin model of a, a Blerio. And my heroes were people like Captain Albert Ball and Major McCudden and so on, the VCs of the First World War, and I just wanted to fly. And also I thought that boys in the uniform of aircraft apprentices looked <laughs> very good. So I decided I'd like to wear that uniform and applied to join as an apprentice. The Royal Air Force, however, rejected young Whittle. He was too small. I uh, was sunk for the time being, but before I left the camp, a, a very kindly physical training sergeant, if you can imagine such a thing, uh, uh, took pity on me and he gave me a diet to follow and a series of exercises, Max Alding exercises. I did all that for six months. I put on three inches on height and three inches on my chest. So I thought, well, I'll have another shot. And I wrote to the ministry, but they said, no, once you've uh, been turned down, you've been turned down forever. So I thought, well, I'd go through the whole process again as I'd never had, in the hope that the uh, bureaucracy wouldn't pick it up. And I was lucky that time, and ended up at Cranwell in number four wing. Whittle didn't enjoy life as an Air Force apprentice. In that rank, he would never get to fly. What brightened Whittle's life was the Model Aircraft Society where he became the leading light at building working replicas. So much so that uh, the initials BWMAS, which stood for Boys Wing Model Aircraft Society, was, most people said that meant Boys, Boy Whittle's Model Aircraft Society. Because we, our, no, we were known as Boy Whittle, Boy Smith and so forth in those days. Whittle's skills at making model planes singled him out to the authorities. Perhaps he might be officer material. There were to be uh, five cadets selected from number four wing at Cranwell, and uh, I was number six in the passing out list. So when the number one boy failed because of his eyesight, uh, it made me eligible. The founder of the Royal Air Force had his doubts, though. 
Lord Trenchard nearly stopped it because um, I hadn't been a leading boy and I hadn't made my, uh, no kind of a name in sports on which a lot of weight was put in those days. Whittle's CO had a compelling reason to make Trenchard think again. He thought that he'd got a, a, a mathematical genius. It was this natural gift that got Whittle a cadetship. Less than 1% of apprentices made the huge step to join the elite in the officers' training college at Cranwell. Although this was next to the apprentices' wing, it was socially another world, one that shared the culture of the public schools from where most of the cadets then came. In the bleak Lincolnshire countryside, Frank Whittle's life now took a new direction. Cranwell provided a very intensive education for Whittle. For the cadets, just as it is today, the highlight of the course was the flying lessons. I learned to fly on the Avro 504K. That was a, a very ancient type of aeroplane, 1911 type. And it sort with a toothpick between the wheels, you know, uh, to prevent it tipping over on its nose. Uh, which in reality, it helps it to tip it over on its nose <laughs> or even turn upside down. Whittle was soon a daring, even overconfident pilot and one who had his fair share of accidents. I'm, I have to confess that I wrecked uh, two or three aeroplanes. Three at least, yes. <laughs> the, the first one, I got lost and wanted to get back to Cranwell when the visibility had deteriorated very badly. It was the day, incidentally, of the cross-country run at Cranwell, which all cadets hated. And they, uh, most of my fellow cadets thought I'd done it to get out of the cross-country run. In between learning to fly and studying at Cranwell, Whittle first conceived the idea that would make him famous. It all started with a student thesis. All cadets had to write a thesis, and I chose future developments in aircraft design, rather ambitious, and rather concentrated on the engine side. But the main thing in that thesis was that uh, I arrived at what I now know, know was the well-known Breguet formula, I wasn't familiar with it at the time, connecting speed, range, engine efficiency, and so forth, and to me, that meant that if you wanted to go very fast and far, you would have to go very high, heights of 50,000 feet, that sort of thing, at heights where the piston engine obviously wouldn't work, and at speeds which the pro pro uh, where the propeller wouldn't work. So it was, I started to look for a new kind of power plant. Whittle prepared this paper during the first half of 1928. But his findings at Cranwell were the fruit of the five years he had by now been training there. My Cranwell thesis, um, when the professor marked it, he wrote on it, uh, in effect, that he didn't really understand it. But he gave me 30 out of 30, which I thought was quite satisfactory. Whittle envisaged flying speeds of 500 miles an hour, at a time when propeller planes struggled to reach 150. These machines were noisy and shook the pilot terribly. That's because their engines were actually car motors on a bigger scale with many moving parts. Whittle felt an aesthetic dislike for such power plants. The problem with the piston engine as you go up height, even though you supercharge it, is that the power drops off as the air gets thinner and there eventually comes a point where it, it won't generate enough power to turn itself over against its own friction. Whittle's idea would use the same principle as a balloon filled with air. When this escapes, every child knows what happens. 
but it wasn't clear how an engine might recreate such a force. I considered a piston engine driving a fan inside a hollow fuselage and then thought, well, why not throw that piston engine away, up the compression ratio of the fan and substitute a turbine for the piston engine? And there was the turbojet. By now, Whittle had left Cranwell, but his search for this solution had preoccupied him ever since. It didn't come to me out of the blue but for the simple reason that I've been trying to find it for 18 months. But just the, the thought, get rid of the piston engine and substitute a turbine, you might say that came out of the blue, whether I was having a bath or what, whatever at the time, I couldn't tell you. Whittle's plan proposed just one moving part. This would be a shaft with a compressor, driven by a turbine at the other end. It would work like this. The compressor spins round, sucking air into combustion chambers at many times atmospheric pressure. Here, this air is mixed with vaporized fuel and ignited. The hot gas created expands through the turbine, turning the shaft and escapes into the atmosphere. It is this continuous force which propels a jet aeroplane along. The turbojet concept brought with it so many natural advantages. A very big factor in favor of a, a jet engine was that when you went up high, uh, the air temperature was very low, very cold, and that benefited the compressor a lot. It meant that you could get a, a much better conditions for the compressor. And the other thing is that in a normal turbine, the velocity coming out of it is wasted. In the case of the jet engine, that was completely used. After the idea had come to me, I thought, oh my goodness, why didn't I think of this before? And it seemed so obvious then. This was Whittle's moment of genius. He had seen the future of powered flight, and he was a pilot officer, aged just 22. I was at the Central Flying School at Wittering, uh, doing the flying instructor's course. One of the instructors there was W.E.P. Johnson, who became a very good friend and colleague in later years, and he'd been trained as a patent agent. And he became very really in interested in my proposal. He thought it would work, and he helped me to draft a patent. Have you ever patented anything? No, I don't know a thing about it. Does a patent both publish and protect? That is the whole point of patents. But one thing's essential. File a patent application before touting the thing round, otherwise you haven't a hope. I'll tell you what, let's rough out a specification now. Oh, what? Fine, what do we do? Well, you make a rather better sketch and I'll get on with the clever bit, the writing. Okay. Armed with his patent, Whittle offered his idea to industry. No one thought it could ever work. According to the theories of the time, there was this fundamental difficulty with gas turbines, inefficient compressors, inefficient turbines, and the other big snag was the materials then existing in 1929 couldn't stand temperatures of more than, say, about 500 degrees centigrade. But I knew, or felt pretty confident, that they would evolve in the normal course of development, and of course they did. The positive young officer also went to London to put his revolutionary concept to the Air Ministry. Whittle fared no better when he met A. A. Griffith, one of the ministry's top scientists. I went to see uh, uh, Dr. Griffith and another scientist at South Kensington, explain the idea. It was very coolly received. Uh, Griffith uh, pointed out an error in my calculations, and it was all rather depressing, you know. And then after that, I got a letter from the Air Ministry saying, in effect, that uh, they weren't really interested and so forth. It didn't help that um, I hadn't then received an engineering degree. Soon after this rejection, Whittle seemed to have more bad news. After I completed the flying instructor's course, I very nearly got posted to number four FTS, Abu Swear in Egypt. That would have been a real nail in the coffin of the jet engine if that had happened. Fortunately, the posting was changed. Whittle remained in Britain and served a year as a flying instructor. These were happy times for him. 
In May 1930, he married Dorothy Lee. During this period, he also got the chance to develop his exceptional flying skills. He was now one of the RAF's best pilots and was chosen to fly in the Hendon Air Pageants, where he thrilled spectators with his skills at crazy flying. These were the red arrows of the day, and Whittle loved entertaining the public this way. At this time in Germany, a young scientist was eagerly looking forward to his first trip in an aeroplane. His name was Hans von Ohain. I always dreamed about the beauty of flying. My first flight with a commercial airplane, I believe it was a three-engine Yonkers. It was a great disappointment. It was so noisy and so vibratory that I felt the piston engine and propeller is not the good propulsion system. The elegance of flying is destroyed by it. The sight of smoke rushing from chimneys inspired von Ohain to think. If that force could be created by a turbine, maybe he could make a smoother aero engine. High speed was not the primary goal. To me, the smoothness and low noise was more the starting point of my thinking, but as I thought about it, uh, I noticed that, as a matter of fact, it will be capable of driving the airplane faster. Britain's air ministry had declined to keep Whittle's patents a secret. Freely available, they quickly made their way to Germany, just as the Nazis came to power. These patents were widely read in German aviation circles, at the same time that Hitler was rapidly building a new Luftwaffe. Whittle's idea aroused no such interest in Great Britain, and his own jet engine remained stillborn. Yet the Royal Air Force was certainly keen to nurture its inventor. After four years, every general duties officer had to specialize. He was given a choice between engineering, radio, navigation, physical training, and so on. Uh, but I didn't get a choice because having been pestering the Air Ministry with inventions, they just said to me, you will be an engineer. Though they'd stopped sending officers to Cambridge, they decided that I should go. So I went to Cambridge in uh, September 34 to take the mechanical sciences tripos. Once at university, Whittle applied every piece of learning to his idea for jet propulsion. I had got the feeling, rather, that I might, might be ahead of my time. Um, with the extra knowledge I gained at Cambridge, I did become a, rather more aware of the difficulties. Then this letter arrived in the post, which says, My dear Whittle, this is just a hurried note to tell you that I have just met a man who is a bit of a big noise in an engineering concern and to whom I mentioned your invention of an aeroplane sans propeller, as it were, and who is very interested. He's jotted a note at the top of the original letter. He says, this letter changed the course of my life and triggered a revolution in aviation. And it did, because this letter rescued the turbojet idea in this country from oblivion. The writer was Rolf Dudley Williams, an old friend from Cranwell. He visited Whittle at Cambridge with another former officer named Collingwood Tinling. And they approached me with the idea of forming a company and getting on with it, and they succeeded. A merchant bank was the catalyst. Our well, Falcon partners were approached by an intermediary, an engineer named Bramson. Uh, Williams and Tinling got in touch with him, and he got in touch with Falcon partners, and Falcon partners commissioned him to write a report on the whole project, which he did, and it was wholly favorable. Brampton's report, you might say, was another of the big key points in the whole story. He'd been very much involved with aviation. He was a pretty skillful aeronautical engineer. And his report inspired Falcon Partners to go on with the job. And in uh, March 1936, they formed the company called Power Jets Limited. Whittle told his backers the project had a 1 in 30 chance of success. 
The Air Ministry quickly added another obstacle. One clause said that I was not to work more than six hours a week on the job. But, of course, uh, that didn't operate as a, an effective control on me. I worked all the, practically full-time. At Cambridge, Whittle also had to fit in the task for which he'd gone to university in the first place. And I very much wanted first-class honours. So I had to work like hell because I was designing the jet engine and preparing for my finals at the same time. And that was um, a very difficult thing to do. I succeeded in getting my first, happily, and then was able to turn back to the jet engine. Whittle approached a manufacturer in rugby to build the world's first jet engine. British Thomson Houston made steam turbines. Whittle drove over from Cambridge, rehearsing what he'd say to persuade the huge company to accept a contract. He succeeded when all he could offer them was £2,000, well below what his project really needed. The proper scientific way to go about the job would be to build a compressor and test it build a turbine and test it, build combustion chambers and test it, and then put them all together when we, the results from each were satisfactory. But the cost for that would have been th about £30,000, and there was no hope of getting that amount of money. So the only, way, the only thing to do was go ahead with the complete engine. What we were doing was uh, trying to prove the engine right from the word go. In a cavernous rugby workshop, Whittle set to work on this huge challenge. The BTH built the engine, and I stood over it, more or less, while it was going on. I felt that we were going to be all right as far as the simple centrifugal compressor was concerned. I felt that I, the turbine was going to be all right, but I was uneasy about the combustion problem, because we were aiming at 24 times the kind of in combustion intensity that was um, obtainable in those days. But the engine became ready for running proper on April the 12th of 1937. A lot of people said it wouldn't even turn itself over. What did happen proved the very opposite. I gave a signal with my hands to raise the speed with the electric motor to 2,000 RPM, and that was done. And then I opened the main control, and it, it started to all right. It accelerated out of control, and so did everyone standing around it. They all went down the factory like the wind. I didn't because I was petrified with fright. I just couldn't move. It seemed like perpetual motion, but uh, of course it wasn't. The fact was that a, a, a pool of fuel had accumulated in the combustion chamber, which we didn't know about, and that was keeping it running after I switched off the control. Well, that sort of thing happened day after day. We had about four of that kind of runaway. Just after the engine first ran and we'd submitted a report to the Air Ministry, this was the subject of a, another report by Griffith, the man who turned the job down in the early days, and his report damned it with faint praise. Uh, he brought in all the difficulties, said that no propeller meant that we wouldn't have the slipstream to help us take off and so forth. Whittle didn't know that in Germany some people were by now far more willing to bet on his idea. One of them was Ernst Heinkel, a legend in his country's resurgent aviation industry. Fono Hein had been introduced to him. He was alone in his villa in Warnemünde. He explained to me that he wanted to finance the whole thing by himself if it works. And he said, I have the best aerodynamics, I have that the best, and best designers, and uh, I want you to tomorrow to speak with them and explain your ideas. Mm -hmm. I loved the Baltic Sea coast very much. I sure would think that would be a nice place to work. And uh, so I 
choose Heinkel. Additionally, I felt I was afraid to go to in engine companies. I thought they were too much ingrained in their recip engines, and my model didn't work sufficiently good. Heinkel's company was attractive for another reason. The whole development was very inexpensive, but when we would have asked for more money, we would have gotten it. So money was not a problem. By contrast, the power jets kitty was empty. As the Nazi threat grew, Whittle had a war winner, yet Britain was set to abandon it. There were several things which hampered progress. In 1937-38, the worst was the tight financial situation. Our financial backers began to get cold feet. They had, uh, quite unrealistically, expected that within a, a matter of a month or two, we would have an engine capable of flying in the stratosphere. Well, of course, we had breakdown after breakdown, and they began to lose heart. And they did not produce the, the money that they promised. The, the Air Ministry were very hesitant to help because we were in financial difficulty. After we'd first run the engine and shown that it at least was self-driving, they did agree to um, a very limited contract. The ministry's grudging help only created new problems. As soon as they gave us a contract, we came under the Official Secrets Act. That meant that we couldn't tell people what we wanted their money for. You can't go to someone and say, look, we've got a damn good idea, would you let us have some money? Uh, we can't tell you what it is, uh, but it's very good. No, it, uh, we couldn't do it. By 1939, Britain had spent just £7,000 on Whittle's jet. His very position on the project was perilous. At the end of June, he was actually due to leave power jets. On his last day there, Whittle had to impress an important visitor with his engine. On June 30th of 1939, we managed to get a big breakthrough in the attitude of the Air Ministry in that uh, uh, Pai, Director of Scientific Research, uh, came up to see the engine run, and we managed to keep it going for about 20 minutes in his presence, and he became a complete convert. So much so that he, he agreed that uh, an engine for flight should be ordered, and that an aeroplane to use it should be ordered too. When I drove him back to the station to get his train back to London, I had the curious experience of him explain to me all the advantages of the engine, that it could run on any fuel, that it was vibrationless, etc., etc. And I just sat quietly, I was only a, a, a squadron leader at this time. I thought, yeah, you're telling me, old boy. <laughs> this, of course, was the big turning point in the whole job. The turbojet was saved for Great Britain. But Germany, unaware of Whittle's breakthrough, already had a jet plane. I was uh, very certain that it would work. But, of course, you always feel there's a danger. And um, we had made not too many pretests. We ran uh, the engine before it flew uh, perhaps several hours at the very most. The support of a huge aircraft company had enabled Hans von Ohain to overtake Whittle. Heinkel's HE-178 was ready just days before war broke out. Test pilot Eric Varsitz was eager to take off. He started and then he disappeared. And after a while he came back and we thought, oh, he's landing. He didn't. He made another round and we said, oh my God, he must like it. Uh, but we didn't have the airplane very filled up with gasoline. He landed and stopped the airplane just where Heinkel stood. And he said, everything functioned beautiful and and, and the engine worked well, and he was, he was really himself very enthused. We had a nice festival. A jubilant Heinkel rang General Ernst Udet at the German Air Ministry. I learned later on he called Udet and he said, hey, congratulations, but let me sleep. That's an ungodly time. <laughs> By now, Frank Whittle had been forced to move power jets from rugby to a scruffy foundry at nearby Lutterworth. Ladywood Works was the name of the site, 
Today, there's nothing to show that history was once made here. But in these buildings, Britain slowly expanded its jet program. In 1939, we only had uh, uh, just a handful of, of about half a dozen. And uh, then beginning of 1940, we began to build up a team. And I was very careful in picking uh, real quality. You know, first class honors Cambridge, first class honors Oxford, Imperial College of Science. We were advertising. Of course, we couldn't say what we were ad advertising for. And when we were interviewing them, we couldn't tell them what we wanted them for. Though I think some of them guessed from the questions we asked. Whittle's charm and enthusiasm at once inspired his new team to strive for the impossible. The noise and lack of space at Ladywood forced Whittle himself to work at Brownsover Hall, a country house nearby. Here he worked through the night, desperately aware that his work could shorten the war, and drove himself to nervous exhaustion. My memory of him really was just somebody always working. And when he was at home, if he took any time off, say Sunday, he would sit in his chair by the fire at Broomfield and we'd be there with his slide rule, which of course people used in those days to do their calculations, and um, bits of paper all over the place, working, and a little bit of time for myself and my brother, but not much, not much. As Britain entered its most critical phase of the war, the expanding team at Ladywood was galvanized by a new order to prepare engines for a prototype jet fighter. Codenamed F940, we know it as the Gloucester Meteor. As a potential war winner, getting it in the sky to fight the Luftwaffe now became the focus of their work at power jets. They did not know that Germany was by now developing its own twin jet combat planes at Messerschmitt and Heinkel. The country's prototype jet, the HE-178, had not been a success, but its last flight was exploited to the full by its maker. Heinkel invited the air ministry to come, and the highest who came was Udet, and somehow Heinkel used that possibility to offer a new design of a two-engine fighter aircraft. And actually, he got the contract about two months later. The plane was the HE-280. The Nazis wanted it in 14 months. Heinkel passed this demanding deadline to von O'Hein to build its jet engines. Well, Heinkel wanted things very fast. He was very uh, um, optimistic, very positive but a little bit unreal and unrealistic in his time schedules. In Britain, the Air Ministry still wouldn't fund Frank Whittle properly, forcing power jets to work in impossible conditions. In addition to our continuing financial problems, we had many others like having to use the same parts over and over again when they ought to have been scrapped. And of course that was linked with the finance because we couldn't afford new parts. We had to make do and furbish up damaged parts. Some people continued to claim Whittle's jet wouldn't even fly. By May 1941, his engine was ready to go in Britain's first jet plane, the experimental Gloucester E-2839. For its maiden flight, the top-secret aircraft was taken to Cranwell, where the jet story had begun. The Power Jets team followed, full of hope. On the same day, a young naval pilot, Eric Brown, was forced to land at Cranwell. Today, he's one of the few surviving witnesses of this historic occasion. When, when I landed, I was a bit astonished to find so many civilians present. And uh, when I went to check in at the mess and asked what was going on, there seemed to be almost an air of conspiracy about the whole place, and um, nobody would give a straight answer to this. We'd been out the day before for tax, some taxing trials, and then on the May the 15th, the weather looked as though it wasn't going to uh, work out. So I went back to uh, Lutterworth. That morning I went to the control tower to check 
if the weather was good enough for my own flight to Croydon, but it obviously wasn't. And they said, would I mind doing a weather check for them? Anyway, I landed and um, they said, would I be prepared to do a further weather test in the afternoon? And then we got a message to say that the weather was clearing, so I rushed back to Cranwell again. And in the evening, uh, Jerry Sayre did the flight. An airplane was rolled out with a shape I had, well, not so much the shape, but the construction of which I'd never seen before because it had no propeller. And an extraordinary whining noise came from it and it taxied out to the end of the runway and after a while eventually took off. And I was quite astonished to know what it was because I'd never heard at this stage in my career of a jet aircraft. The various government ministries refused to film this remarkable event. Luckily, an unknown photographer grabbed it in secret. Jerry Sayre was sitting at the end of the runway, and a party of us was sitting just to the right. And he held it on the brakes and ran out the engine to full speed, released his brakes, and then he, he hopped off in about 600 yards. Quite an impressive takeoff. Then he held it down level and then climbed. One of my colleagues, Pat Johnson, W.E.P. Johnson, slapped me on the back. He said, Frank, it flies. And in the tension of the moment, I rather rudely said, that was bloody well what it was designed to do, isn't it? Mm. And it landed successfully. And immediately it landed, it was absolutely inundated with people rushing out and congratulating the pilot. So I realized something quite extraordinary had taken place people in the area hadn't heard that uh, particular kind of noise before and you couldn't really hide it however secret it was supposed to be. Uh, one officer was said to have asked another one how does that thing work John and John replied oh it's easy old boy it just sucks itself along like a hoover. Another story was that someone who claimed to have been an eyewitness said there was a Merlin engine inside the hollow fuselage with a little propeller and he'd, he'd seen it. He was a, <laughs> a reliable witness, he claimed. Well, everybody gravitated towards the officer's mess. And so I followed on, and there was quite a lot of hilarity going on in a corner of the room. I asked what it was all about, but still nobody would reveal what was involved. But um, it was quite obvious, it was something quite momentous. The flight vindicated Whittle. Britain's new jet plane was better than anybody had realized. One event particularly brought the point home. The ministry gave us permission to open up to 17,000 just for one flight. And at that um, engine speed, it did um, 375 or 380. Anyway, it was faster than the Spitfire. The news reached London and Winston Churchill he ordered a thousand Whittles. Alas, the E-28 could not be a warplane, hence the disappointment felt behind the scenes up at Cranwell. I would have preferred it to have been the Meteor, which was then on the stocks, because that was a combat aeroplane, whereas the E-28 was just an experimental aeroplane. Whittle's jet served notice on all piston engines, a notice that fast reached their manufacturers. They now demanded their share of a product none had invented, and which they'd rejected for years. Because of the war, Whittle would have to share his secrets with them. All this, of course, was um, putting power jets into a weaker and weaker position from the commercial point of view, and that we had to uh, swallow because it was a wartime situation. And I and several other of my team were serving officers, and uh, we had to put um, national considerations before commercial considerations. That was very dominant in my mind. Whittle played a selfless, patriotic role, in which he offered his knowledge freely to the British aviation companies. However, they were working flat out to build engines for planes like the Hurricane and the Spitfire. So in 1941, Great Britain turned to the United States, then at peace, for backup in manufacturing its jet engine. The Americans had only been told about Whittle's power plant earlier that year. Ironically, their top scientists had dismissed the concept in 1940. 
They concluded the gas turbine engine could hardly be considered a feasible application to airplanes. The British government expected to keep the rights in Whittle's invention and did not intend to give it away to a future competitor. But that's inevitably what happened. We shipped over the engine in parts in the Bombay of a Liberator, also with the team, who were horribly frightened lest the pilot should pull the wrong lever and they'd all drop into the Atlantic. The company selected to build the engine was General Electric. For America, the jet story began the night of October 4th, 1941, with the arrival of a highly secret engine assembly at a Boston airport. It was Britain's now famous Whittle turbojet, the first jet engine successfully produced and flown by the Allies. Gentlemen, I give you the Whittle engine. Consult all you wish and arrive at any decision you please, just as long as you accept a contract to build 15 of them. General Electric had that engine, their engine, version of the W2B, called the Type I, on test in April of 42, so just rather less than six months, which is astonishing. And even better than that, six months later, the Bell Aircraft Company had their twin-engine jet flying. It was agreed that I would go over and help them out. And so I went over at the end of May. I went to Lynn under an assumed name. They insisted I use an assumed name. I called myself Whiteley. There were times when I forgot it, like uh, in the hotel I would sign, waking up, sign for my early morning coffee and forget that I was supposed to be using an assumed name and, and of course, sign the real one. I'm told that uh, that didn't matter, really, because uh, the waiter was an FBI man. In the Great Republic, Whittle was treated royally, and he, in turn, was astounded by what he found there. It was most satisfying to see the work GE were doing because, uh, well, they got on with the job so fast. It was uh, remarkable, and their enthusiasm was most inspiring. And I thought at the time, if only I had had that kind of cooperation a few years earlier, what a difference it would have made. In America, doctors found that Whittle was by now battling with severe ill health. Back in Britain, the problems that caused it had only got worse. The engine that was destined to be the power plant of the Meteor was a more powerful version of the experimental engine, really. There were no major difference. It, it looked quite similar from the outside. The Royal Air Force eagerly awaited the Meteor, but Powerjets was not allowed to produce the engines for it. That job had been contracted to a car maker, Rover. Glasses were getting on with the job fairly well, but Rovers were making an absolute nonsense of the engine. They kept the, they just hadn't got the people who could do the job, and they thought they, they, thought they knew what to do. The uh, situation became so bad that it looked as though there would be a complete hash of everything. The rover were, the rover were making such a poor job of the engine that uh, the order for the production of the Meteor was cut right back. Rover tried to redesign its engines and held up the Meteor by two years. But there was also dirty work. We intended that the uh, rover company should be uh, subcontractors and only subcontractors. But unfortunately, they went behind our back to the ministry and, and trying to get direct contracts. And eventually, they succeeded in doing that. And instead of being subcontractors to us, they, in effect, became competitors who had the advantage of having all our information handed to them on the orders of the ministry. In December 1942, a solution was at last found to the problems with Rover. Rolls-Royce took over the job of building Whittle's engines. But the mighty company would only weaken power jets further. Ernest Hayes was the chief executive of Rolls-Royce. He was responsible for the Rolls-Royce part in taking over the jet development. Of course, he, he had come to realize that this was the future of the aero engine. And since Rolls-Royce then were one of the most prominent aero engine firms in the world, he wasn't going to be left out. I would call him an honest rogue because when he was going to do the dirt, he told you he was in advance. And one of the things uh, he said to me on one occasion was, he said, we're going to be the center of this job and nothing you, you can do will stop us. By 1943, uh, the Rolls-Royce having made such a big difference to the prospects of the engine, the ministry agreed to 
reinstate the production of the Meteor. With Whittle's engines, the plane finally made its first flight that year. Yet it should have been ready two years earlier. And had the Air Ministry pursued Whittle's idea back in 1929, a similar plane would have been available by the start of the war to repel the Luftwaffe. Lives would have been saved. The war even shortened. At least the work of Frank Whittle could now have a bearing on how that war was fought. I thought that he was doing something quite important because every time I asked my mother what he was doing, she used to say, oh, well, Daddy's doing something very hush-hush. I didn't become aware that he was anybody out of the ordinary until 1944 in January when they um, made the whole thing public and then the house became surrounded by reporters. We, we had been working in complete secrecy until uh, early January 1944, at which time, for reasons I don't really know, um, the British and American governments decided to uh, make an announcement about it. <laughs> it was like the world blew up around me. The shock was very considerable. Whittle and his engine dominated the front pages. Says here in the Daily Herald, I knew Frank had a secret, says his wife. So the cat is out of the bag. How strange it seems to be able to talk about it. It may mean that I shall be known throughout the world. In any case, my younger son, Ian, is a far brighter boy than I was at his age. I think he will be a success, the success of the family. <laughs> Had you seen that before? No, I've never seen that before. <laughs> oh dear, how wrong. As industry reaped the rewards of Whittle's genius, new jet fighters joined the Meteor. First off the drawing board was de Havilland's brilliant Vampire. The pilots loved their new equipment, although the planes remained highly secret, as Eric Brown discovered when he came to fly them. When I was allotted to the jet flight at Farnborough, of course it was a top secret flight, and it was in a hangar at the far side of the airfield, well away from the main activity and there were um, RAF regiment guards there with guard dogs, so it was very highly guarded at the time. Once inside, the plane was a revelation to Brown. For getting into the cockpit of a jet airplane for the first time, you are struck by the wonderful view, um, because in a tricycle undercarriage, no propeller or large engine ahead of you, it is quite remarkable. And once you start up the engine, although to listen to a jet, if you're outside the cockpit, it sounds thunderous. When you're in the cockpit, it is incredibly quiet. Frank Whittle often visited Farnborough to check how his invention was performing. It was quite obvious he was itching to get his hands on it and fly it. But we were always alerted that he was coming, and a little memo would be passed round saying, would you make sure that the 2839 was not serviceable for flight on that particular day? And um, because this would stave off Frank, it was obvious they didn't want this wonderful airplane and this wonderful man to be united in case there was a, an accident. So. He twigged this pretty soon, and I think he played a lot with it. In July 1944, the Gloucester Meteor became the first jet fighter to enter operational service, when the Air Force allocated its initial supply of planes to 616 Squadron at Manston in Kent. By now, the Luftwaffe could no longer mount air raids over Britain, but these Meteors were quickly put to work intercepting a lethal new menace, the V-1 guided missile. Germany's flying bomb terrified the Londoners who were its target. In the skies over Kent, the Meteor pilots sought to prevent V-1s reaching the capital. Some used their wingtips to flip the missile over, so it crashed. Around this time, Allied pilots were startled to find themselves being attacked by a German plane with no propeller. This was the Messerschmitt 262, Germany's own jet program had by now advanced to this sophisticated design. It had been chosen instead of the HE-280. The Nazis never liked Heinkel and had cancelled his promising jet fighter. 
yet it could have been mass-produced by 1944. By contrast, the 262 arrived late and was rushed into battle too soon. In Britain, meanwhile, Frank Whittle seemed at his peak. He was a national hero, while his company now had a custom-built factory from which to expand. He had a clear vision for its future. I always wanted to include manufacturing in our duties. In 1944, power jets had reached the point where they were able to produce, say, batches of 40 or 50 engines. And we had a first-class nucleus uh, for proper manufacturing organization. Power jets also had some outstanding work in progress. Whittle was already planning the second generation of jet engines. There was the LR1 turbofan, which would have been the first turbofan in the world. There was the um, engine for the Miles M52, the supersonic aeroplane. Those were our two big projects which we had in hand. LR1 stood for Long Range 1. Whittle saw the scope for jets that would fly planes further as well as faster than pistons. But he would need a more efficient engine. Uh, from the earliest days of the turbojet engine, I was bothered by the fact that it has a basically low propulsive efficiency, about 50% as compared with, say, a propeller at moderate speeds of 80%. And so the answer to me was that we must gear down the jet in some way. And that led to the concept of the turbofan, for which I took out a patent in 1936. The turbofan is a turbojet to which a fan has been added. This fan causes air both to flow through the core of the engine and to bypass it. This additional jet of cold air increases thrust and improves fuel economy. The design had huge potential. With a turbofan, you can expect propulsive efficiencies of 75% or even better if you have a very large bypass ratio. As piston engine bombers approached their design limits with planes like the Lancaster, Whittle saw a timely use for his new bypass jet. As the war progressed, in 1943, for example, uh, I came to the conclusion that it could be the answer to uh, a long-range bomber for the Pacific War. We also visualized it as an engine for a transatlantic airplane. Whittle was already predicting long-range jet airliners and the kind of engines they would need but it was the other power jets project that would grab people's attention. The engine for the supersonic plane, the M52, was uh, an aft fan with afterburning that all tacked onto the back end of a W2700 jet engine. And that should have given sufficient power for the Miles M52 to do a thousand miles an hour. I think it would have done it. Despite its huge potential, Whitehall never felt comfortable with power jets. It was a private company, but its driving force was a serving officer and it was publicly funded. The fault lines were clear. I realized that there was a complete mess uh, from the contractual point of view. There, was no, there were no effective agreements and uh, no one except power jets had risked any money, except the government, of course. And I felt that uh, the government having put in two million, that all the companies should be nationalized, forming a collective turbojet establishment, and of course, I hoped that power jets would be the uh, at the top of the pyramid, with myself as chief engineer. Whittle's proposal was considered in the high levels of government. Sir Stafford Cripps, the Minister of Aircraft Production at that time, used what I'd said to get the ministry out of the mess that they created by nationalising power jets only, which relieved them of all their undertaking. It was expected that power jets would still continue with its advanced engine projects. But then other firms began to uh, cr uh, create difficulties. They said they weren't going to have the government competing with private enterprise. So considerable pressure was brought to bear on the, the ministry. And the minister caved in to the large aero engine companies. So we, the people who had pioneered the whole thing, were deprived of the right to design and build engines. <coughs> Sorry. That was too much for myself and my leading team members, and most of us uh, resigned. 
the supersonic plane and the turbofan project had by then been cancelled. The civil servants found a reason to justify this loss. Believe it or not, the minister said that people wouldn't want to fly at speeds more than about 250 miles an hour. As Whittle left power jets, he was acutely aware of the commercial opportunity that was now at stake. The position in 1945 and 1950 was that Britain was really ahead of the world in uh, all forms of gas serving development, but stupidly we allowed the lead to slip away. In 1945, the Allies discovered the Germans' impressive range of jet planes and their designers. After the capitulation of Germany, I was at that time in Farnborough, the CEO of the captured enemy aircraft flight. So I was sent to Germany and to look at their advanced aircraft and also at the same time to interrogate their designers and test pilots. Amongst them was von Ohen, and naturally I wanted to know what his connection with the Whittle patent had, or patent had been in Germany. But he was not going to answer this question. He was very non-committal and sidestepped it as much as he could. Brown flew the various German jet planes, including the Messerschmitt 262, the Allies already knew that its engine, the Yumo 004, was a sophisticated axial flow design. Now they could compare its performance with that of the less complex British jets. So a more efficient engine in many ways, it was highly unreliable. The Yumo 004, in operational service, had a scrap life of only 25 hours. And the engine, when I flew this engine, I found it extremely sensitive and difficult to handle because it did not like quick throttle movements, either accelerating or decelerating. Any quick throttle movement either way could possibly cause a flame out of the engine. Whittle's jets were more reliable, but he could take them no further. The course of events brought anguish. I think my mother was most distressed by what was happening to, to father. She was most distressed. I, I could remember her crying about it at times because she would tell me, oh, dad is so unwell because of what's happening and it is such a shame and how can they treat him like this? Yes, it's very sad for her. He managed to soldier on in the RAF. He was an air commodore in 1946, but in the end, by 1948, he'd been declared as unfit for flying, and somehow that triggered, that was the last straw, and he, he and the RAF both agreed that he should retire, and he did. It's been very sad for him. Oh, very sad, yes. The Air Force was everything to him. The public knew none of this and saw a war hero receiving his just rewards. In 1948, Whittle went to Buckingham Palace to collect a knighthood. He also had a financial award for his invention, which was good for the time. Worth nearly £3 million today, it would soon become clear he was greatly under-rewarded. He sought a role, but his stature made him hard to place in an industry he himself had founded. No engine maker hired his services. In many ways, I paid quite heavily for um, uh, the, the work I did. There was the awful race against time. That dominated life. On top of all the technical difficulties, there were the financial difficulties, there was the skullduggery of uh, uh, people who were uh, messing things up, and uh, oh, it was frustration after frustration, and it took its toll. I began to have a series of nervous breakdowns. And for years, it was years before I really recovered my health. Britain stole a march on the rest of the world when it launched the first jet airliner. The beautiful new plane, with its four engines, was a fruition of all Frank Whittle's early visions. First, after he left the RAF, he turned his mind to the introduction of the Comet, 
and he joined BOAC as a consultant to help them introduce the comet into service. He was very worried at the time that the thing was being rushed into service. I've got his 1949 diary where he discusses uh, the strength of the square windows and uh, he was worried about that at the time and um, was making a suggestion to de Havilland and how they could get over the problem. Whittle's advice was ignored. The comet crashes which followed were caused in part by its square windows. With time on his hands, Whittle travelled and tried to recover his health. He also turned to writing his memoirs. The jet age took off without Frank Whittle, but the Royal Air Force was soon re-equipped with the benefits of his invention. By 1950, the Gloucester Meteor provided the backbone of Britain's air defence capability. It was a fitting outcome to all the secret toil of the power jet's team in the dark days of the war. The nation did at last build its own supersonic fighter in the shape of the English electric lightning, while jet engines also powered an awesome British fleet of nuclear bombers. But the country could never really afford such planes. They would later play an important role in the Falklands campaign, but were destined to become museum pieces. British civil jet planes fared little better. After the comet crashes, it was Boeing 707, which brought long-range jet travel to the masses. By 1960, airlines were mostly buying their planes from America. That year, the bypass engine entered service. Turbofans soon followed. With their far better fuel economy, they were just what the airlines needed to realize low-cost global travel. For Frank Whittle, it was the ultimate vindication of his wartime vision and revealed the sheer folly of cancelling his pioneer turbofan. Yet he never worked on jet engines again, and memories began to fade of how the story had begun. I think in this country they were beginning to forget all about Frank Whittle by the 60s and 70s. It was all so different in the United States. They were so much more gung-ho. They were very good at slapping him on the back and telling him what a good chap he was. In 1976, Whittle went to live in America. I think he felt more recognized over in the States than he did over here. After the war, Hans von Ohain had himself moved to America to work on jet propulsion for the US Air Force. Fascinated by each other's work, Whittle and von Ohain became good friends. Back across the Atlantic, Britain eventually rediscovered its genius of the jet. By 1986, even um, the Queen took a hand and awarded him the Order of Merit um, and other honours came along f following that. So I would say from about the early 80s onwards people began to remember who it was who was the prime pioneer of the turbojet. And also a man with a profound legacy. Today, we make almost one and a half billion air passenger journeys a year, cheaply and safely, thanks to Frank Whittle. He shrank the world, but his gift to Britain is less appreciated. Its famous plane makers have departed, but today, Rolls-Royce is a world leader in building jet engines. I'm often asked how I feel about it, and it's a question I find very difficult to answer. Things could have been a lot better. We could have had a much bigger influence in the war than uh, happened. But when I see what's happened in, in the way of civil aviation and uh, military aviation too, but particularly civil aviation, I can only say it's extremely satisfying, especially when you see something like the Concorde. And one of the things you see I never foresaw when I was working on this thing, is that I would be a passenger crossing the Atlantic in three and a half hours. And incidentally, another thing I didn't foresee is that I would have a son who would be flying 747s as a captain in Cathay Pacific. Kai Tak Aerodrome at, uh, at Hong Kong was, uh, had a very 
interesting approach, a curved right-hand turn right down to almost a touchdown. And uh, when father came with me in the back of the, in the cockpit in a Boeing 747, um, he, he was very startled when he saw that his son was flying an airplane at a thousand feet straight towards the foothills <laughs> and then making a, a steep final turn, which of course was quite normal at Kai Tech, it was the way you had to do it. I, had, I hadn't briefed him, unfortunately, so he was, he was very white-knuckled by the time we landed. He was continuing to theorise uh, in aerodynamic improvements and aero engine improvements until the end of his life. He always took an active interest in Concorde and uh, looking into a second generation SST, supersonic transport, and making recommendations and speaking publicly and privately uh, amongst uh, the industry to try and encourage the uh, airframe manufacturers to take the risk and embark on another generation of supersonic transports. Concorde is a marvellous aeroplane. I've flown it many times, but I'm looking forward to the next generation of supersonic transports, which I think should be capable of uh, carrying 300 passengers for distances of the order of 4,500 miles, like San Francisco, Tokyo at speeds of about, a mark number of about 2.3, that's well, getting up to 2,000 miles an hour, uh, as compared with the Concorde's 1350. But beyond that, uh, I think we're going to see even much higher speeds than that in due course. Unfortunately, they're going to be very expensive propositions. Sir Frank Whittle died in August 1996. Assured of his position, as the greatest aero engineer of the 20th century. The Royal Air Force paid fitting tribute to its distinguished son with a memorial service at Westminster Abbey. He and I had wanted the opportunity to fly together, preferably in an open cockpit biplane so that together we could loop and spin and climb and dive. This modest ambition was never realized for one reason or another. The nearest we got was when I flew him to Hong Kong in a Boeing 747. On the last morning of his life, I leant over his bed and said, Dad, let's put on our kit and go flying. He opened his eyes and looked at me and smiled. That evening, with Hazel holding his hand, he died. And I wondered, I wondered if he went flying and if he did, if he went on his own, or did he have a companion? He was cremated in the USA, and the air attaché there um, brought his ashes over to this country and I went to Heathrow to meet the aeroplane and I came home and put the ashes on the bookshelf in my study with the ashes of my mother who died three weeks earlier. I uh, decided to put them in at the church of Cranwell and they organized a, a meteor and a vampire so we flew the ashes up to Cranwell and they were in, interred there with a little ceremony.